In the spring of 2002, Kilauea Volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii began an eruptive episode now known as the Mother's Day Flow. This activity is seen by Department of Interior U.S. Geological Survey scientists as a continuation of volcanism that began dramatically in 1983. Pu'u'o'o vent on Kilauea's East Rift Zone began spewing fountains of lava and building a tall cinder cone in January 1983. Lava broke from fissures, then burned and bulldozed through forests. Traveling over the surface and underground in tubes, it eventually reached the sea. Pu'u'o'o was established as Kilauea's most prolific vent of the 20th century. At Kilauea, you, you really have a very complicated plumbing system because magma rises beneath the uh, summit of the volcano and then moves underground about 12 miles to Pu'u'o'o, which is, the, is where the eruption has been centered for the past 20 years. Uh, from Pu'u'o'o, uh, lava then gets into a, a lava tubes or into lava flows on the surface and advances as far as the coast, about, 11, uh, about uh, 9 miles away, uh, 12 kilometers away. There's a lot of lava being erupted every day. It, it's, it's kind of spread out, and so people don't really realize that. But it's the equivalent of about, uh, about a tenth of a cubic kilometer of lava per year. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, that's about 300,000 cubic meters per day. Well, what does that mean? So if you really put it in context, that's about 40,000 10 cubic yard dump trucks full of lava each day is erupted by Kilauea. A 10 cubic yard dump truck is about the size of a dump truck that you would see at a highway construction project. On Mother's Day of 2002, a new vent broke out uh, just beyond the southwest base of Pu'u'o'o. And lava flowed out of that vent. It flowed um, south-southwest for a ways, got over into the forest, and then flowed uh, toward the south-southeast through forest uh, all the way to where we are here now, starting fires and causing a big problem uh, in the park. Lava subsequently then has extended out to the coastline. This entire lava flow, starting on Mother's Day, and continuing up to the present, we call the Mother's Day flow. He's funny, RQ it. Uh -huh. Don Swanson is part of the U.S. Geological Survey's team of scientists stationed on Kilauea's summit at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Good view angle. Which one? The Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is situated up on the rim of Kilauea Caldera, and the scientists working there are charged with basically monitoring the day-to-day -day activity of the volcano in order to anticipate changes in the activity of the volcano, both at Kilauea and Mauna Loa and Hualalai volcanoes. How, how was the activity out at the uh, full field? Uh, there's a uh, off the base of Pulamapali, and then a uh, small uh, ocean entry at the uh, High Castle, uh, kind of sticky uh, coming over the little cliff. Okay, David, thank you for the report. Oh, wow. A network of seismometers is spread across the big island of Hawaii. Linked to seismographs at the observatory, they pick up swarms of earthquakes as magma shifts, moves, and rises. This is one of the scientists' most important cues for forecasting eruptions and anticipating change. We got one more chance. All right. Don't let it pull you in. Okay. We can always buy a new hammer and cable. What we're doing right here is taking a a lava sample. We take one every every week, um, as as close to Pu'u'u'u as we can. The reason why we uh, do that is is that we want the least crystallized sample that we can get a hold of, so that we can um, analyze the glass chemistry.
These samples have been taken, you know, for the last 19 years, and it all goes into a database, and it's handed from handed along from one um, researcher to the next as they come and hold this this position. So we take turns carrying the baton for these long-term studies. Well, the main thing that goes through our minds when we sample these things is, is that we um, don't go out in a place where the roof is so thin it's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse. <laughs> That's what goes through our minds. Thousands of tourists have swarmed to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, eager to witness the amazing flows firsthand. You can take a good close look. Wow. Here's a spot in the world where lava is flowing into the ocean over cliffs, and it's an experience that people never get to see most, in most places in the world. And here it's, we have a drive-in volcano at Hawaii Volcanoes, but down here it's, it's basically a walk-in volcano where people can go out to the areas that's open to the public and walk right up to molten lava flowing across the ground within a few feet. And if the timing is right, they can watch it go over the cliff into the Pacific Ocean. And that's an experience that's unlike anything in the world. Our primary job is to educate the people on the dangers down here at the lava flow. What even on areas that are open to the public, things can happen. And we try to encourage people to be aware of the surroundings, to listen to the lava flow, or listen to the volcano and, their, and the volcano's heartbeat when they're down here. And to have a good time, come to Hawaii Volcanoes, have a great time, but be aware of where you are. And to look and to listen while you're down here looking at the lava flow. It's most critical that people are aware of their surroundings while, while they're having a, a great show. Most mornings, uh, including weekends for that matter, I try to get out here um, before daylight because I can see the patterns of glow and incandescence, which is much easier to see at, at night than during the day. And uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, photographs, digital uh, images if, if things are really happening. And then I drive back to the observatory and, and try to put things on the website as quickly as I can. The website is HVO dot wr dot usgs dot gov so i write an update uh, in words of, as to what's happening to what's been happening during the past 24 hours and then try to include the images uh, to give the public an idea of just what's happening it's been a, a pretty good piece of information for us to know you know say if we're going to go in the field it's good to know that somebody's looked at it already to see if um, you know there's maybe another place that we could go to get the same kind of uh, experiment going I know that it's been a huge hit with the public uh, and that they see his pictures, which are uh, superb pictures, and they kind of know what the viewing is going to be like that day, uh, or at least a little bit of it. And I think he really um, makes the public way more aware of what we do, actually. Several extinct lava tubes in the park convey the vast carrying capacity of these subterranean channels.
The volume of lava passing through a lava tube can be measured with radio waves. The cross-sectional area in this tube started to decrease all of a sudden in a very linear fashion. Uh, and at that time, the, the tube system had split a couple of times. There were, it was feeding two entries down here, uh, places where lava is going into the ocean. And so it seemed pretty robust, but it was clear that uh, because of that signal of decreasing cross-sectional area of fluid that we would interpret that there was less fluid going through the tube. And sure enough, as uh, the weeks progressed, the tube started to clog up because there wasn't enough going through it to keep it hot. Uh, so the entries died off. Uh, this tube is nearly dead right now. And most of uh, what is going into the ocean is coming out of a whole nother vent over here. On its way down slope, skylights look into the tubes. Breakouts spill lava onto the surface. When the lava first erupts, it's at a temperature of around 1167 or 68 degrees C. That's something a little bit over 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. It quickly cools, of course, and, and the crust begins to form at a temperature in, of around uh, 11, or, uh, around 1050 or 1100 degrees uh, C. But it's, it's still very, very hot to walk on, obviously, at that, uh, at that temperature. The lava flows quite, quite smoothly um, when, it's, when it's very hot, um, except when, it's, when it has a certain degree of crystallinity or when it's lost a certain amount of gases or is traveling uh, down a steep slope. And then it tends to lose its fluid nature and become a kind of a jagged, uh, rocky mass. Uh, we call that an aa uh -uh flow, uh, as opposed to the fluid kind of flow, which is called pahoehoe. Lava meeting the sea underlies the long history of the Hawaiian Islands. Volcanism has been occurring here in Hawaii for at least the past 70 million years. There's a hot spot deep within the Earth's interior that basically fuels, it provides the heat above to melt rocks at a depth of about 40 to 50 miles. That magma, or that molten rock, starts to rise to the surface, accumulates in shallow magma reservoirs, and then erupts onto the surface to form the volcanoes that we see. And because the uh, Pacific Plate is moving out towards the northwest at 8 to 10 centimeters a year, the volcanoes basically grow, and then they get rafted away from this hot spot within the Earth's interior. As a consequence, we get this series of volcanoes and series of islands extending off to the northwest for over a thousand miles. Most of the volcanoes in the chain are now submerged seamounts, long ago eroded to below sea level. Volcanoes that built the Hawaiian Islands are mostly extinct. Age dates of lavas, shown here, record the time passed since islands sat over the hotspot. The islands erode and get smaller with age. Sheer cliffs on many of the islands record cataclysmic erosion. They are ancient landslide scars, left from moments when huge chunks of the islands were thrust back into the sea. This cycle of growth and decay is being repeated on a smaller scale on Kilauea. When lava pours into the ocean, it uh, quenches and forms a rock right away, which is broken up mostly by the surf, but a little bit of it isn't broken apart. It, 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 it maintains, it, it's stuck on the old sea cliff, for example. And this gradually builds out a kind of a delta or a bench, as we call it, uh, out into the ocean. 
The benches are built on a rubbly material that has formed as lava went into the uh, ocean. And so it's very unstable, has a very uh, weak footing to it. And uh, these benches can form um, quite rapidly. They, they can extend 100 feet out to sea uh, in just a couple of days or so. And they look pretty benign. This, this very flat terrain, lava pouring off the leading edge into the water, sometimes breakouts on the surface. People don't really realize how uh, weak the underpinnings of the bench might be and how hazardous uh, that it is. So one of the things that we try to do is educate the public uh, to stay off of the bench. There have been four fatalities that have occurred uh, because of people going on the bench. And we don't want to have uh, any more, but it, uh, such fatalities are inevitable if people continue to go on the benches. I started flying uh, when I was about 12 or 13. My dad's a recreational pilot, so he, uh, he started me flying at a real young age, actually before I started driving a car. I've been flying for the U.S. Geological Survey here on the island since about 1987. And uh, we've had an eruption on this island actually since 1983, uh, nearly continuously. And so it's provided a lot of you know, needs for helicopter support. I consider myself real fortunate to be able to work with these uh, geologists that, that are up at the Volcano Observatory because most of them are, are you know, some, some of the best in the field in what they do and, and they're nice enough to, to uh, you know, take time to explain uh, what goes on around the volcano to me, just a lay person. And uh, you know, it's, it's always a learning experience and I have probably some of the best teachers and so it's, it's been a real good relationship with them. Back in the 1980s, the road got buried further up the way here. And the lava here is about 1995. And this area was the High Castle parking lot that I'm sitting on. And behind me here, the silvery lava is lava that came out in the last week. So it's an ever-changing scene down here. This lava that's eight years old or seven years old, and lava behind me that's one week old. And perhaps in time, this lava, where the smoke is, is gonna come through here and bury this whole parking lot. It remains to be seen, but it, it could happen very easily. It could be, this could all be gone tomorrow. A week following this shot, the road was covered with oozing Pohoihoi lava, filling in the low spots, adding yet more new earth to Kilauea's foundation. An amazing variety of textures cover the lava's surface. Cracks radiate intense heat. offering a glimpse at a cooling flow's molten interior. That's perfect, yeah, hopefully. Graduate students from across the globe carry out important work on the volcano. These volunteers come each summer to assist with the sampling and day-to-day -day tasks monitoring Kilauea. They gain the opportunity to focus in on specific aspects of volcanism, forming the next generation of scientists to track the volcano. Always something new happening uh, and because of the 20 years um, we've had just incredible opportunities actually to do experiments you know sort of unusual to be able to do experiments in geology in the field but uh, you know we've learned a lot about how lava flows move different kinds of lava flows uh, so that you know we've got a little experiment ready to go the next time say an aha flow presents itself uh, we missed an opportunity last week but uh, we're ready for the next one uh, we do a lot of time lapse to, you know, capture very subtle changes, long-term changes. Um, there's just always something happening, never a dull moment. They're 
have been a lot of highlights of my stay here. Uh, probably the biggest highlight though was way back in, in 1969 when uh, we watched uh, really towering lava fountains come out of a vent that later developed into the, a place that's called uh, Mauna Ulu. The fountains were 1,800 feet high in the air. We saw that a couple of times. And, and uh, uh, two pit craters, one of them quite a, a large pit crater, were totally filled by lava during that eruption. And one of the pit craters, uh, in fact, uh, had almost filled and then the bottom dropped out of it and the lava drained away and then lava had to refill it. And I saw that. I, I didn't see the draining away, but I saw the refilling process from one side of the crater with the, with the high lava fountain behind feeding the lava flow into the crater. And of all the many wonderful experiences that I've had, I'd say that that one probably is at the very top of the list. For me, some people say it's old hat, but it never really is. Every time I come down here, it's a different scene, different view, different scene, different scenario. Like this morning, I'm down here with both of you, and there's lava going over the river, over the cliff, into the ocean, making a small bench. And while we're here, part of the bench collapses, and there's a big steam plume and some mini explosions. And every day, every day is different. And I find it, I'm still in awe to watch lava flowing over the cliff because it's, it's so unique. And, this, and being downwind and the heat, that shimmering heat that you can see, and the high humidity and the smell of sulfur and that smell from the, off the ocean of that salty, salty spray, it's, it's fascinating. Seeing rock flow across the ground just doesn't really happen, right? I think for me, each time I see a lava flow oozing across the ground or forming new land into the ocean. It really does sort of bring back this idea of the creation of the earth. I think this whole process is one of creation. And uh, the more you, that you live on an island like this that formed by this very process, you realize how your very existence here and the existence of all things here are basically dependent on this process of creation. And so you know it has to occur and it's just a, an incredible thing to witness and observe and also to have an opportunity to study and to be able to characterize in a, in a meaningful way. I guess what we're taking for granted is the fact that this island is still growing and you know man's occupation of the island extends back only uh, you know, several thousand years. I think the, the uh, somewhat date that they selected is around 600 AD when the first Polynesians arrived here on the island. And um, we've only seen really a fraction of the life of the volcano. Most of these volcanoes erupt for a million years or so. And um, where everybody's living on the island is basically subject to change. And like they said, for Kilauea volcano, every several thousand years, the entire surface of the volcano is recovered with fresh lava flows. And so we're in, in the years and generations to come uh, beyond us, you know, we're going to see significant changes on the island that's actually going to affect the population. So it should be interesting, maybe not for us, but for, you know, those that come be behind us. The spectacular opening of Pu'u'o'o Vent some 20 years ago marked a new period of growth at Kilauea, an amazing opportunity for scientists to watch and learn, to monitor and track change, to understand and anticipate hazards, and to work with the national park and public to safely coexist with the volcano. This molten paradise penetrates the senses stirring deep feelings in most who witness it, unveiling a sort of primordial tie to the origins of Earth, conveying a sense that the processes alive today on Kilauea have been ongoing for millennia and will continue far into the future.